Hello, Pleasant Green Church family and our listeners. This is lesson three for the date June 16th, 2019. It is from our Faith Pathway Study Manual, and this is still Unit 1 for our summer session. And this is our third lesson uh, entitled, Cleaning Up the Mess. Our devotional reading for this lesson is the 50th number of Psalms, verses 1 through 15. Our background scripture is Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verses 11 through 28, and our printed passage is Hebrews, the ninth chapter, verses 11 through 22. Our key verse for our lesson in the King James Version is verse number 22 of the ninth chapter of Hebrews, and it reads, Almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. And our lesson's aims are to explore the symbolism of blood in the Old Testament in relation to the saving work of Jesus on the cross. Also, since your moral shortcomings and the need for definitive cleansing before the Holy God. And final, rejoice in the purification for sins that Jesus accomplished. Now, our lesson has uh, two sections for the analysis of the biblical text printed before. And so our first section is entitled Christ, our mediator. And that would be from the ninth chapter of Hebrews verses 11 through 15. And then our second analysis of the biblical text will be the blood of animals and that would be from the ninth chapter of Hebrews uh, verses 16 through 22. The first part of our lesson focuses on Christ as our mediator through the verses listed 11 through 15. And here, our lesson highlights to us a contrast in comparison to some degree that Christ has become our high priest and is greater and more perfect uh, then our earthly priests in comparison of the things that are already here, the, the good things that are to come. And so as we look in our lesson and uh, think about this contrast here, uh, Christ is uh, recognized as the high priest. So a priest above priest. So uh, as, as we uh, look at this, well, the question should be asked, why is it significant that Christ would be identified and recognized as the high priest? Uh, is there something additional that is 
attributed to Christ as being the high priest that distinguishes Christ from just a priest. And so when we think of this uh, new covenant, uh, this agreement, and uh, our text uh, refers to it as a testament and then also as a will. And we will entertain that shortly. But when we look at the distinguishing factor between two things listed in verse 11, and one is, is that this tabernacle, uh, which had been used in Old Testament as a tent that the presence of God would move in with the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness experience, that the tabernacle was where the presence of God would be. But this tabernacle was formulated, it was constructed, it was assembled, and it was erected by the hands of man. There were uh, men who were assigned the responsibility, uh, given strict uh, order, and instructions as to how it should be done and where everything should be placed. But in verse 11, it tells us that when it speaks of the high priest of good things to come, it, it identifies those things as being by a greater and more perfect tabernacle one that is not made by the hands of man, and that is to say, not of this building, not of these earthly dwellings, uh, not of tangible things, touched and made and formed by the hands, the fleshly hands of man. But these were, this is a dwelling, this is a presence, that is ordained, uh, that is fulfilled with the Spirit of God. And so this tabernacle uh, cannot be, uh, this tabernacle cannot be deteriorated. It, it cannot fall. Uh, it doesn't uh, wilter. Uh, with the differences in climates and and disruption and destruction and corruption. Uh, this tabernacle is the actual presence and the actual dwelling of God Almighty. And so when we look at what then is the significance between Christ as our mediator and the high priest compared to the priest and, and this building that is formed by hands. Now we're talking about a spiritual dwelling, a spiritual presence. And so we also look at the beginning part of our lesson, verses 11 through 15, that it then speaks of these sacrifices, uh, the sacrificing of goats and, and, and calves and, and the burning of these animals to compensate for the sins of mankind. So now, just a little bit further Ahead of our text, we will read in the 10th chapter of Hebrews, and this is good for us to reflect upon, to distinguish between what actually was in the, uh, 
the understanding that God wanted us to accept and wanted us to uh, dissect and for us to resolve in our understanding so that it would better prepare us into the new covenant and into the agreement which would also give us understanding of the type of conduct and living and the type of submission that we should render unto God. So when we look in the 10th chapter, uh, reading down to the third verse, we read Hebrews 10 and the third verse that it says, but in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins. Therefore, when he came into the world, he said, speaking of Christ, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. But a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Speaking of his Father, God Almighty. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. So we are quite reminded, and for many of us, we're quite familiar with this scripture. But better than being reminded and being quite familiar with the scripture is how it impacts our conduct, how it impacts our hearts and our mind, and how it causes us to demonstrate a new demeanor and a new persona of ourselves that we are no longer living in a manner which actually causes there to be a need for two things to create another sacrifice for the pardon of our sins and also for there to be a reminding of our sins. Because as we read further into the uh, uh, 10th chapter, uh, around the 17th verse, it then says, well, let's start at the 16th verse, because again, we're speaking of the covenant, and we're also speaking of God's will. But it says that this is the covenant. This is the agreement that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. Uh, right here, uh, I just paused to bring this thought as I was reading that because Romans, the 12th chapter, and the uh, second verse uh, tells us, and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Not the renewing of our heart, not the renewing of our outer appearance, but by the renewing of our minds. And God understanding the significance that the mind has over us, for he didn't create a mind for us for it not to have a purpose. So therefore, he says, I'm going to write this new agreement spiritually. I'm going to impress upon it in their minds. And uh, as we look uh, through our lesson, I believe it's in the 14th verse, where it says that this should be purged in our conscious. So it should be something we are aware of. It's it's purged, it's, it's, it's saturated into our consciousness 
that we would not continue in works that would be considered dead works or deadly works or destructive works or fleshly works or works that are not spiritually guided. So the 17th verse of the 10th chapter of Hebrews then says, then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And then it says, now where there is remission of these, there is no longer a offering for sin. So unlike the priest who would enter into the tabernacle uh, once every year and slaughter animals, uh, it, it, uh, the prerequisite or requirement for the animals said that the animals had to be without blemish. So the animals had to have a clean or pure presence. So if the animal itself had to have a pure and a clean uh, appearance, then what does that say about the type of lifestyle that we should be living unto God? And if God would only accept something that was pure and without blemish, then what does that say unto how we should render ourselves as living, not dead, but as living sacrifices unto God? So uh, it, it offers us and says that, well, when this is done, when the sacrifice the sacrifice here we're speaking of is of Christ. So Christ was, Christ is the pure, holy, and clean sacrifice without blemish offered for the pardon of our sins. And unlike the priest who repeated this year after year after year, slaughtering animals annually, Christ put an end to it by rendering himself as a sacrifice on our behalf. And because Christ was the accepted sacrifice, the justification for the pardon of our sins, Christ, unlike the priest, will not be re-entering the tabernacle again for another sacrifice for our continued sins. So Christ is acting as our mediator in the spiritual presence of God, interceding on our behalf and saying, I know their actions have required consequences, but I shed my blood, pure blood, and I purged them with the shedding of my blood that they would be pardoned in your sight, Father. And so as we look upon what our lesson is saying unto us, then we should be overwhelmed by the provisions that have been provided for us in spite of ourselves. Now, we uh, look at our second part of our lesson, and it speaks of the blood of animals. And in our second portion of our lesson, the 17th verse of, again, the ninth chapter of Hebrews, and it reads... In this like, it says, for the testament is in force after men are dead, since it has no power at all while the testator lives. Now, as we look at this verse, 
in the NIV, it says will, and in the King James, it says testament. So, as we unravel both of these meanings here, uh, a will, a living will, it actually stipulates what the promises of the one who developed and who worded their will to be given to the recipients that are named in the will. But as long as the individual is alive, the recipients cannot fully be heirs unto that will and unto the items and the details that are written in it until that person has passed. And once they have died, then the promises that were in their will are now allocated to the recipients that the benefactors that are listed and written in the will. And now they are the heirs of the one who wrote the document, who prepared the document so that they would be ensured that upon their departure that they had already placed and set things in place for the recipients who were to come after their departure. So, now, when we speak of the testament, we are actually speaking of the actual words that are spoken. And many times, when we have people in our midst, we don't always gravitate, and we don't all, we're not always receptive and receive everything that they say unto us. Sometimes we actually appreciate what they said and understand the significance of what they said when they have departed. All of a sudden, although we ask many questions, sometimes we disagreed, sometimes we argued the points, but all of a sudden, when they are removed from us, then the things that they said to us become clear. Or at least we understand what they meant more so. It's almost like as a child, we usually don't have the appreciation and the understanding of the wisdom of our parents until we grow older. And if our parents, if we're blessed that our parents are still with us, when we grow older, all of a sudden, the things that didn't make any sense at all to us while we were young, the things that we felt was just like encroaching upon our swag, so to speak, or the things we felt were trying to restrain my style and my character and who I am, and you're just trying to clamp down on my freedom to be me. All of a sudden, we realize that, you know what? My mom and my dad are two of the wisest individuals that I know. But when they was dispelling this, or when they were uh, delivering this wisdom to me, I couldn't understand it. I didn't really recognize it. Now, I just want to put this in context here. And I want to um, uh, identify it in this light. Because the parents, when they depart and they leave and they go on to glory, uh, those that are able, if they don't leave any materialistic things, any 
financial things. They left us the spirit of themselves and their wisdom and their knowledge. Here is how Christ prepared the testament of himself while he was present among us. And I want to address this just briefly from the 16th chapter of John. The 16th chapter of John, and we'll start it at the 12th verse. And this here is speaking of the ascension of Christ uh, and then the revealing of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So he says in the book of John and then the 16th chapter and the 12th verse, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. You know how sometimes uh, the elders, they, uh, you'll be uh, in a discussion with them and talking with them, and, uh, and uh, they would say, oh, it's just so much I would like to tell you, but, but I know of your impatience, and, and I know how you, you, know, you want everything to be explained like uh, right away. And uh, you want a problem or you want a specific issue to be unraveled, uh, you know, like now. You don't have time to wait for it to materialize and to mature. But uh, many of the things that you're asking me, uh, I can't explain that to you like in microwave sense. Uh, those things developed over time and they're all kind of factors that cause them to come into being. So Christ understood it and he said, oh man, there's so many things that I want to tell you. But however, I can't tell you right now uh, because you can't bear them. However, though, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. And he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you of things to come. He will glorify me for who is me? Christ. And what did Christ say? I'm going to leave, but I'm going to send to you the comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he said, he will glorify me for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Here comes the fulfillment of that will. That Holy Spirit is the mediator. He's interceding in place of Christ. And he's given unto us what Christ said. Well, well since you can't bear everything, I was going to tell you everything I left in the will. But you didn't have time. You weren't patient. You didn't want to hear it. So I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to explain everything that I was trying to tell you. And... At the end, in verse 15, he said, because all things that my father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. We're speaking of the fulfillment of that will, that testament, that life teaching that was present in the embodiment of God in the person of Christ. And then Christ said, I'm going to leave it unto you in my will. And if you will fulfill the desires of my will, then you will fulfill the desires of God's will. So, unfortunately, blood had to be shed in order for this to come full circle. And we remember from the very beginning, according to the scripture, that when the first sin was declared in the Garden of Paradise, in the Garden of Eden, when the sin was declared, sin made the recipients of God's glory, of God's creation, 
of God's domain that he gave over to his creatures to be the rulers of. Sin caused them to feel that they were unclothed. And even today, when we are fully clothed, sin, for some reason, has a way of making you feel like you have been undressed. Because what it does, it exposes what the clothes covers up. It exposes our internal and fleshly desires. And it is expressed or it is revealed by our actions and our deeds. And so what that does is, is that because of that, first, there is the desire to be clothed again. Oh, this is really great to be clothed. It makes me remind about being clothed in the spirit of God by the spirit. But it makes us want to be covered again, to be clothed. And so we want to cover up that which we think is unpleasing unto God. And so they covered themselves with fig leaves. But later, after they had received a notice from God after the act was committed, then God covered them with animal skins. And so blood was shed to compensate for the sinned act. And ever since then, blood has had to be shed for a covering for the sin. And the final sacrifice was made by our mediator, Christ the Lord, our Redeemer. So we hope, as always, and pray that something was said that gives us more insight at this time and in this lesson that equips us to be better prepared to be servants of Almighty God. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.